Good morning, everyone. My name is Maddie, and I'm the digital editor of Art Collector magazine. I'm joining you all from Gadigal Land in Sydney, and today I'm joined by American-born, New Zealand-based artist, Mickey Smith. Hi, Mickey. <laughs> Hi, good morning. <laughs> today for Art Collector's Pull Focus series, we're looking at one of Mickey's photographic works titled Life, in brackets, Redux which is one of the works in her forthcoming exhibition titled New Outlook at Sanderson Contemporary Art in Auckland. Before we get to specifically speaking about life, I think it's important to just zoom out for a moment um, and see how life um, fits in with the series New Outlook as a whole. Um, New Outlook showcases works from your ongoing series volume in which you photograph and document titles of books and journals on the shelves of public libraries. Titles from found books in this exhibition include New Outlook, Life, in brackets Redux, Mana, Trans Tasman, American Girl and Fortune, among others. And so as an introduction, I wondered if you could just speak about more about how you chose and selected titles when forming this body of work. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, it's funny because two years ago was my last solo exhibition with Sanderson and it was at the start of the pandemic. And so uh, the actual, um, the pandemic has sort of informed these two bodies of work. Um, these, the titles that we chose for the first body of work were, um, because it was my first um, show with Sanderson, we had titles like Kyora and Time. And with this exhibition, uh, I really was hoping to sort of move on to other things, <laughs> but really um, a lot of these titles are still quite um, related to the pandemic and, and related to some of the feelings I've had around it. Um, I've lived in New Zealand for about 10 years now, over 10 years, and it's been difficult. My father's died of COVID while, um, while you know, it, what, during the pandemic and, um, and I haven't been able to get home, um, you know, New Zealand's restrictions are still, still some of the harshest in the world. Um, and so a lot of that, um, I've been looking at the collection in, in kind of um, in a different way. So we have New Outlook and Trans Tasman, which um, really sort of refer to being here in New Zealand and and um, and Mana and American Girl, it really I selected those titles specifically because they were dealing with the fact that I really feel the distance between here and my home in the U.S. and my family in the U.S. So um, those four titles specifically. Um, were selected kind of to address that conceptually. Um, I'm, I photograph a lot of different titles and a lot of them are fun and funny. I love wordplay. Um, I love the hunt for the titles. So really in that process, um, I'm starting to settle into the New Zealand libraries. There are a few other titles in the show, Cyclopedia for New Zealand and um, Specific which has an interesting spelling, again, with the wordplay. Um, those titles also deal with the, the distance that I feel here. Um, so yeah, I, I hope I'm answering that question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you don't disturb the books when you find them, you know, in these libraries, instead photographing them without staging or use of artificial light leaving them as they had been placed by the last anonymous reader. Can you speak about your choice to leave them as is, as opposed to manipulating them in some way? Mm. Yeah, so my process is really important in that when I approach uh, a library, I usually go in just with my iPhone and start trolling through the stacks um, if they're accessible. So I will go into a library and in the case of several pieces of this work um, was a library in Christchurch, um, this new central library there. And I'd find titles that were of interest and then I go back and, and speak to the librarians and try to get access to come in and photograph. So 
my, my, my standard letter tells them that I come in with my tripod and my camera. I don't light the books. I don't touch them. I don't manipulate them. I actually really like the concept that these books, especially bound periodicals and journals have been led, um, left on the shelves um, by someone who's, who's needed the reference for them. So specifically, um, I think that conceptually, it's important to me that they, they stay there. And it's a rule just because I've been trained as a documentary photographer and as an artist, um, my, my roots are in documentary and I really sort of have this um, strange way of approaching these books that I've been doing for 20 years now. And now it's a rule that I, <laughs> that I won't break, yeah. um, which sometimes leaves titles behind. Um, there's a title that I photographed once called Blood, which was bound in red and pain was on the same shelf. Um, but it was down at the bottom of the shelf and I couldn't get down with my tripod and my camera to photograph it. So I had to leave it behind. So I left with blood and gut and pain was sort of left on the floor. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for me, that's it's the the process and the way um, the way I've approached it. And now the, the only thing I do to manipulate the works, I don't change the color. I don't change the title. I don't touch them, open them, nothing. The only thing I do sometimes because they're very long exposures just in terms of process is um, mask off the top of them in case there's any light leaks that come through. But otherwise they, they really are. You can still go to the shelf and, and find them um, in the library in their original state. Mm. Yeah, that concept of the documentary, um, you know, your roots in documentary photography, I find so interesting because it makes you, when you're looking as well, create these stories about where, you know, who may have been looking at them, their past lives, all of that. Um, mm -hmm. If, you know, you just start, your mind just goes off on these kind of tangents, wondering what, where they came from, who was reading them. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Well, and, and because they're a very utilitarian sort of um, journals and periodicals aren't access very much especially now and over the course of the time that i've been photographing them they've they've become sort of this extinct animal they're slowly but surely getting thrown away and off the shelves so i've walked into libraries that i've scouted and then received permission to photograph and by the time i get there the title is gone so yeah. it's it's you know it's documentary it's it's a, it's sort of a cultural um, anthropology that I'm looking at is how we're changing and how the books are changing and what's happening to them and, and sort of immortalizing them on this really large scale is is important to me as well. Mm -hmm. um, so for the viewers following along at home, I'll insert a picture of life redux on the screen now. So when looking at this work, uh, the central featured title sticks out slightly forward among the other books, the two on the left, you know, obscured slightly behind their plastic covers and the two to the right looking to appear, you know, slightly battered from age. The middle life is the most intact copy um, standing out, you know, sort of proudly from the crowd rising ever so slightly above. Um, to me, to me, it reads with a sense of optimism. Um, I'm just wondering, can you speak about the composition of this piece? and yeah, what it adds to the narrative of the work. Um, well, this piece um, is, is interesting for a number of reasons uh, for me because I photographed life as a title before um, and I've never issued a title twice, but in the case of life, I found it appropriate because especially as, as, um, as I've gotten older, um, I realized definitely that um, it is exactly that. I mean, it's very intentionally composed with that centerpiece sort of surviving um, and, and the other pieces being a bit tattered. I've also never photographed a book behind plastic. Um, I've always been fascinated by it, but conceptually, that um, they're hard to photograph, but conceptually here, I really liked sort of this unknown, like you don't know what's coming up to the next piece. So um, I also, for me personally, it's a really important piece. Um, you know, I, I don't typically, and I photographed these books for a long time, but I had mentioned earlier that I have been looking at libraries as a metaphor for, for grief. And so there is this optimism, you know, I've, um, I've lost my father, I've lost my husband. Um, I, I have, um, I'm, have met a new partner. 
Um, and, and really life is not at all what I thought it was going to be. Mm. Um, and that you do get a second chance. And so for me, this piece was really important at this time in the show, I'm getting a little emotional about it. But it really is. I mean, yeah. we've all been so struggling through the pandemic, um, yeah. and but all these other things happen beyond the pandemic. You know, you've got life carries on, and we've got our kids that are growing up, and um, and people that we lose, and and babies that are born, and we can't get to them. Um, and so I thought it was a really important um, thing, and it is optimistic because I do believe that. Um, you know, we, life changes and we all know it's, it, it can be hard, but still we're standing there proudly and, and we have that strength to get through it. And I think, you know, one thing that is, will be more um, visible when you see the work in, in person is that it is quite large and, and it will hopefully uh, help with that concept that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, um, something I, I did want to actually ask about and I'll, I'll go on to now was the scale um, and life like your other works are is printed on a large scale uh, 116.8 centimeters by 76.2 um, centimeters so you're really getting a macro view um, something that stands out um, and if you think about from where it came from you know in, in a library that's filled on mass with with books and and things um it's you're going to have a much different experience the viewer is going to have a much more intense experience of this work at such a scale um mm. so i guess i wanted to ask how a sense of scale plays into this work and the others in the series as well um yes i've been making this work for a long a long time and um I think as a photographer, traditionally, sort of, oh, you know, what sizes do you edition something at? And, and several times people have said to me, could you make it a little bit smaller? Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've tried and tried and sort of the, um, the size behind me is sort of as small as they get um, because the scale is so important conceptually for them to translate from being books to having uh, meaning and a message beyond the actual object that I'm studying. Um, so in order for them to have their their second life, they need to have that scale translated. And sometimes it's really hard to convey my work digitally. I think um, I've, I've experienced more than once people walking to a gallery or a portfolio review and, and saying, oh, now I get it. Once you sort of stand in front of the work and it quits, it no longer is really about being a book spine. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, that's something that I struggle with as an artist in the digital age, how to convey that. But um, there will also be a large scale installation of mana at the New Outlook show. And um, I've done large scale installations of power. And so sometimes when I make my decisions about scale, um, they are because of the message that the word is conveying. Mm -hmm. um, I did do in a medical series once um, I photographed a, a title called Headache, but I only made them tiny, um, like little, I've never made anything. So they were called a little headache a little and I headache. issued a hundred of them. And so they're just these sweet little things, just have a little headache. So mm -hmm. I think, again, it's fun to play with the scale and, and have a bit of a bit of humor that goes with it. And it doesn't always have to be so serious, but um, okay. yeah, I, I like, um, it's important to me in the work. Um, so yeah, life will have more of a presence. That's, that's for sure. I did want to ask you about the title um, as, as I clarified before. So it's life in brackets redux. Um, and normally it, correct me if I'm wrong here, the titles are just left as the title of, of the spine. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, could you speak about the decision to, you know, include Redux uh, at the end of the work for this work? Yes, I think that it's, um, again, uh, I never reissue titles. So oh. once I photographed a title, um, it, it's, I'm, I may have the same answer for you here, but um, oh, no. uh, I never, I, I don't reissue titles. So once it is, um, once the title has been created, in my mind, I move on, but life is such a big and long and important title. And it's an important um, 
it was an important periodical as well. I mean, internationally, uh, I, I'm also very interested sometimes in finding what the meaning is um, behind the, the books once I photograph them. So Life is um, obviously Life magazine. Um, uh, and I think that because it was such a long publication, um, I, I've seen it bound in many, many, many different ways. Um, there's a, in the uh, last exhibition, perhaps there was, I found Vogue. It was one of the first titles I found two <laughs> decades ago and I found it bound in gray. Mm. Um, so it's a very dull, flat gray. And I thought it was very interesting that a bindery clerk of a librarian would tick that box like, oh, I've got this Vogue title, let's make it gray. <laughs> No, um, right. Uh, but as the years went on, I found it bound in blue and bound in red and bound in yellow and collected all of those over a period of time. So eventually I made a giant installation where they were all those different colors. So I think again, um, that that's been an interesting part of the process, but life redu the, the life redux is really, is really about my personal experience um, and, and, and having a, a completely different life than I thought I would. <laughs> and, and yeah, it speaks yeah. really close to that. Cool. Well, I, I do just actually have um, one last sort of question or topic that I wanted to ask you about. And it sort of harks back to what you were saying about Life, Life Magazine, I guess. Um, living today in a society that's saturated with imagery, signs, symbols, and advertising, and then also, you know, this age of hyper-consumerism, constantly unnecessarily replacing and buying goods all the time. Um, you've spoken, I mean, Life Redux has, you know, this very personal meaning to you, but I guess as one of the readings that I had of it was, um, like how do the themes of consumerism connect with some of the titles, maybe not necessarily life, but some of the other that you've saying Vogue before as well. Um, does that ever, you know, you know, how does that kind of come across in your works, those themes of consumerism in, in this day and age that we're living in where everything's so fastly evolving, mm. I guess you would say, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's part of the reason that I love the, the simplicity of the spines. So if you take life, you'll have perhaps in this book, um, and I don't know because I didn't pull it off the shelf to look, but perhaps in one of these books, you would have taken those 12 magazine titles and the clerk would have cut off the spines and bound them together in this book. So for me, when I look at this, perhaps, you know, these five books, mm -hmm. I think about you know, is that five years of culture? Maybe I would guess I could probably find if I went my negatives, maybe in the seventies or eighties. Mm -hmm. And what is five years of life look like at that time? And we don't know, but we know that um, behind these titles that can be often just flipped. And I mean, we all have magazines sitting on our on our shelves, on our on our coffee tables or our shelves that we read or don't read, <laughs> we make them into the the bin. Um, and I think that that's um, I think there's a loss of culture because things come so hard and fast, and we do consume them and they go away. Mm -hmm. This was one attempt um, that librarians have been have made to capture that moment of time. Yeah. Um, and they're very, as I said, very quickly becoming obsolete. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, and they are not getting scanned and digitized. Um, there is a lot of material. I work a lot with the Internet Archive um, and utilize their, um, for other projects, I utilize their online records. And there's no one that's taking the volumes of periodicals and journals and scanning them often because they're so out of date. I mean, I think a magazine is like life will have a cultural value because it is very specific to um, that time, but perhaps something like a, um, I'm trying to think of a title in the show or a journal, um, a journal like uh, Blood, which, or a journal like New Outlook, yeah. Um, it, it, they're a little bit more practical. They're not really for your, they're not produced for your entertainment. Yeah. Um, blood would have been produced for hematologists to refer to. 
um, for their for their profession. So yeah. blood journal from 1982 is not going to help a hematologist in, in 2022. Might be fascinating, but yeah. that's why a lot of them, um, before I left the US, and we have a very different culture about how we consume books here in New Zealand, but one of the things I was doing before I left the US was creating installations of floors of these books mm -hmm. that you would actually walk on because there were so many that were being discarded. Um, in New Zealand, it's a very, um, the public has a very different relationship with books. Uh, you know, there are less of them. Sometimes I just looked at a book today that I was ordering and I tried to order it from the local bookstore, but I couldn't. So I went to Book Depository and it said, oh, well, it will be here in 20 to 25 days. So I think, you know, maybe once they get here, everyone wants to hang on to them. Yeah. But in the States, they're throwing them out by the dumpster full. So I would take the books out of the dumpster and lay them on a floor. The FedEx man would come into the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> you have to cross, walk across several hundred books yeah. in order to deliver a package to the gallery on the other side. Or we had a, a huge installation of four tons of books in, a, in an alternative art space in Kentucky. And, and, and the kids would come in and have their, um, come in to do uh, talks to them. And we'd have all the little kids sitting on the books. They're not glued, they're not touched, they're just there. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting relationship we have, you know, to run your hand along a book or open it or hear that crack mm -hmm. in it. So there's, um, uh, and a lot of these books have <laughs> never been cracked because <laughs> no one really has occasion to go back and look at them. Um, so when you do open them, you hear that snap but sometimes they get thrown away before that ever happens. Mm, yeah, which is a, sh a real shame. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Wonderful. Well, on that note, um, yeah, I encourage people who are watching to come to your exhibition. Um, so New Outlook runs from the 15th of March to the 10th of April at uh, Sanderson Contemporary Art in Auckland. And Mickey, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really wonderful to hear all about your work and life redux in particular as well. Thank you.